Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, where I bring you ancient wisdom for the modern mystic. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today, all the way from California, is Dr. Richard Tarnas. Rick, thank you so much for being here. It's my, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for uh, inviting me. You're very welcome, Rick. Rick, I'm super excited to dive into the conversation that we're going to be having today. But before we get there, for those of you who this is your first time joining us here on the Oraculos True Divination Podcast, this is a podcast where I bring you interviews from astrologers and mystics all around the world who aren't just changing their own lives through their astrological practice, but they're also contributing to this greater field of astrology that we all know and love. So if you want to continue to be a part of the magic and the momentum that we're building here on the Oraculos True Divination podcast. Give yourself a moment, go down below. Yes, do like this video, but also subscribe to the Oraculos True Divination podcast and hit the notification bell so that you can receive notifications of when I bring you these interviews each and every week. Now, Rick, I'm super excited and thrilled to be here sitting with you for several reasons. And we spoke about some of that before we went on. One of them is that I have always wanted to attend the California Institute of Integral Studies, where I know you play a very pivotal role in the shaping of the programming that goes on there. So that is the first thing. And then secondly, I have always been a fan of your work. I came into your work when I was still in university myself. And I think I must have heard an interview with you speaking someplace and you just spoke so profoundly and so deeply about the role of spirituality within Western civilization that I knew I wanted to be a part of whatever your world was. And so I bought Cosmos and Psyche, your book, and I've also read through Passion of the Western Mind. And it has been so enriching to be able to sit in your work that is so scholastic, but also so deep. So thank you for your contribution to not just philosophy, but also to this field of astrology. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that you have been able to uh, take my books in. That they're, they're two big books, and I, I appreciate the um, exploration that would have led you there to be able to appreciate them. And uh, also, yeah, the, the California Institute of Integral Studies, uh, the graduate school where I teach in San Francisco, it really, it's an extraordinary uh, graduate school because it's, on the one hand, it's accredited, but on the other hand, it's, uh, it's adventurous and it, it uh, is committed to the idea that uh, we can't properly understand philosophy or psychology or the, or um, or our current state of the world, if we don't take into account the, the spiritual dimension of human experience and uh, the evolution of religious consciousness and um, extraordinary states of consciousness and, and the role that um, religion and spirituality have played in, in the unfolding the shaping of our, our worldview, uh, even the most modern, secular, disenchanted worldview actually has very powerful spiritual and moral um, background to it and, and motives that are in some sense hidden within it that, that, that have driven it and uh, trying to make that more articulate and, and conscious in a way, bringing the unconscious of our of our culture to consciousness is uh, kind of a central task. So anyway, at the at CIIS, as we call the school, um, the the program that I founded there twenty five years ago or so, uh, more than that, uh, the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program has allowed us to, um, with the my fellow faculty, it's really allowed us. Uh, to bring together dis different disciplines like philosophy and uh, the history of cosmology and depth psychology, you know, Jung and um, Groff and Hillman and feminist uh, uh, depth psychology and so forth with uh, 
an appreciation of the esoteric traditions like astrology. And um, it's really been very fruitful. The, the, there's been really hundreds of graduate students have come through our program over the last, uh, I guess it's 28 years. And uh, it's been a great um, experiment in education that we had no idea was going to you know, un unfold as fruitfully as it has. As you speak, Rick, I'm reminded of something that was said by Manley P. Hall, who also operated within the San Francisco area, where he said that we all must accept within ourselves that science and our current rational worldview will inevitably come to a dead end if it continues to push away from its inclusion those parts of humanity which are powerful and potent though invisible so to hear that that has been a singular charge of ciis to integrate these portions of ourselves back into ourselves that may not necessarily be as tangible as the physical body or that may not necessarily be corporeal the thought that you would even have the vision to bring that into the structure of a traditional well rather non-traditional educational setting but to provide people with the information that they can use to enter the traditional working field uh, I, I think it's it's brilliant thank you i mean the whole idea is to build bridges really uh between the the um these poles within our culture both of which are are very um valuable and worthwhile and in, in some sense like you use the word uh the rational worldview of the you know the modern mainstream scientific perspective and so forth and it's not that the uh that the deeper broader uh worldview that we are birthing in our time um, uh, through great uh, upheaval uh, obviously in the in the in the collective right now and uh, the state of our planet but th that larger and deeper worldview it's not that it's not rational it's that it brings um, a as you as you know it's a it's a it's a a deeper and more expansive view of rationality. Uh, it's a it's a rationality that is not disenchanted. It, it is in um, close dialogue with with the soul and with um, with the uh, depths of the of the psyche and with the interior of the cosmos, which is which is excluded. The idea of the cosmos having an interior, having a having um, a dimension of um, agency and purposefulness and intelligence and spiritual depths that's just off the table for the for the disenchanted mainstream uh, worldview so it has that has defined rationality in a very narrow way and um, astrology itself is a, an extraordinarily rational system it can always be deployed irrationally uh, in a um, in, but as long as you are taking account, it, it, what we need is a kind of continuing dialogue between um, rigor and imagination. We need both, and if you just just have the imagination, uh, you can um, have fun, but you don't necessarily. Uh, you're, it's not necessarily. Uh, grounded and um, capable of uh, entering into the dialogue with the, with the larger cultural worldview. And if you just have rigor, you just get locked into, um, locked into procedures and uh, a kind of flat one-dimensional view of, of the world. And we really need to bring our, our whole depth of humanity to engaging uh the the universe and 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 see the art and poetry and beauty of it and not just uh, the uh mechanics or the the uh the mathematics as as profound as the mathematics are 
it's really interesting that you would mention this concept of us needing both imagination and rigor, because how often do we find within the spiritual field in general, not just astrology, even though we know it has also manifested in astrology, but how often do we find this dichotomy within the heart of the practitioner between I'm just going to be spiritual and I'm just going to do whatever comes naturally to me and I'm going to develop an intuitive relationship with this practice. And on the other end of the spectrum, the same spiritual practitioner who says, I'm going to follow it by the book. I'm going to get every calculation right. I'm going to do all of my research and I'm going to have it peer reviewed. And that person essentially losing something of that imaginal process within themselves for the purpose of creating a more rigorous or scientifically appropriate spiritual system. But what you're saying, which is something I believe as well, is that we need both of these things to essentially interact with each other so that we have both the groundedness as well as the profundity in order to function within the world. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a great um, characterization of the, in a sense of two types or type, um, you know, kind of ideal types. Uh, I don't mean ideal in like they're both great, but ideal in the sense that every person is a bit of a mix of the two, but uh, you do have a kind of um, tendency to be, or many people have a tendency to be more of one type than the other. And uh, you've characterized the, both of those very, very well. And you can see how each one of those has uh, their, um, their, their downsides uh, and, like a person who is just, you know, just going to let it flow and they're going to do their astrological reading from their gut, so to speak, and their, and their, and their uh, immediate intuition. Um, there's, there's too much uh, likelihood that that reading is going to be shaped by their own subjectivity. Um, they're going to, they, they'll be projecting the, their own um, uh, kind of interior framing of things onto the world without an adequate um, I-thou relationship with, with the person, with the chart, with, with the uh, deeper reality. And, this, and then the other uh, type that you characterized where they're all procedure, they're all f following the, the, the rules, they're going also just exactly by what's going to be approved by the peers, et cetera, peer reviewed journals, whatever. Uh, the, the danger of that, of course, is that you're, you're not in touch with the living soul of the, uh, of, of the uh, anima mundi, the soul of the world. Uh, and you, you're, you're more stuck in a kind of uh, mechanistic proceduralism that can get very dry. The one can get too wet, <laughs> the other can get too dry. We, 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 we need to find uh, a real balance uh, between the two and uh, kind of bring about that, um, what Jung called the, the uh, conjunction of opposites, the conjunctio oppositorum, um, which is a, uh, in a sense, becomes a sacred marriage, uh, a, uh, 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 an integration of the two poles that brings about a higher reality than, than would otherwise be possible. It's interesting also that you would mention Young and this concept of the conjunctio oppositorum, because we both know that he got that language from a study of the alchemy that had gone before. And what I find really beautiful and heartening about that is that we know that Mercury or Hermes Trismegistus is the patron saint, as it were, of alchemy. But something I was saying to a group of my students the other day is that in reading the Tetra Biblos of Ptolemy, Mercury is the only planet 
who has the ability to hold within himself these two contrary qualities. No other planet holds these two qualities of wetness and dryness within themselves. The sun is hot and dry. Uh, Jupiter is warm and moist. But Mercury has this ability to essentially be completely wet and completely dry. And when I think about this, I think about the concept of bhakti yoga within the Vedic tradition, as well as the concept of jnana yoga, which are a path of knowledge as well as a path of devotion. And so I'm, I'm wondering for you whether or not you see our relationship to astrology being this same sort of way where there are these two paths that can essentially operate independently of each other or whether you do think that we need to take up this mercurial task of applying rigor to our practice as well as finding the deeper spiritual core of it yeah that's 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 good the the mercury uh hermes um figure is is a is like the archetypal you know messenger of the gods the messenger who bridges between between the gods between the realms uh, and uh th that's that's its function and you're calling upon the ptolemaic vocabulary and their way of uh in the early almost 2000 years ago now uh categorizing the different uh bodies in turn planetary uh principles in terms of uh, wet and dry, hot and cold, um, those, those kind of fundamental qualitative vectors uh, helps to bring, bring that to bear. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the two types of yoga that you brought up each have their own um, kind of dignity and value completely in themselves that completely, you know, do, I mean, some people are cut out for a kind of devotional relationship to the divine. Other people um, uh, are, in some sense, they flower uh, best through the exploration of knowledge, not in a, but not in a kind of dry procedural way, but one in which uh, there is a um, a warm-hearted mind, a soul-filled. Um, uh, intellectual exploration. You, um, Rudolf Steiner called it uh, the, the need for like warm thinking. Um, it, it need, you, you need to have both. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the dominant trend or where that person, that kind of person really feels they can flower may be through um, Janana yoga uh, that op opens up their spiritual path opens up best that way. I remember Joseph Campbell, who was one of my teachers uh, at Esalen many years ago. I just, um, I just, when I brought up rigor and imagination, that phrase comes from Gregory Bateson, who was another teacher uh, of mine back in the 70s at Esalen uh, and, and, and a friend as Joe Campbell was. But Joseph Campbell used to, when people would say, well, do you meditate? What's your meditative practice? And uh, uh, he says, my form of meditation is uh, is, is scholarly research and and, and writing. Um, and he he said it's and I I know just what he's talking about. It, it's he you could see that that was his calling. That was how the universe in its depths spoke to him. It's through the mythic language uh, that he was able to kind of uh, articulate for many people to be able to open up to uh, after years in which myth was just something that was uh, seen as being a kind of idle fantasy rather than representing the deep uh, power, powers and forms of, of human experience and of, of, of the cosmos itself. So, um, yeah, you, I want to just emphasize that one can have an emphasis, devotional uh, religious practice where the focus is on the heart is entirely uh, a noble path on its own terms. And uh, but I uh, just as the um, the uh, you know, the, the, 
it's the bhakti yoga but the um the, the form of, of yoga that's more knowledge oriented it also has its intrinsic dignity but when we're talking about let's say the exploration of astrology and the use of it in um uh counseling and talking to other people about what their natal chart is about, what their transits, their progressions, their relationships, and so forth. Um, one really needs to bring in, uh, needs to bring in both. Um, if you just have one or the other side of either too much focus on the um, dry mental uh, analysis uh, <clears throat> or too much focus on I'm just going with what my spirit tells me in the moment, the int intuition of uh, how I see, well, this is how you were, this is what this is what you were last lifetime. I can see it in your chart. Uh, and then this is gonna happen to you uh, next year. No, I wouldn't get in that relationship. This, these charts just don't match. That kind of um, astrological predictive, uh, co very concretely predictive approach that is uttered by the some astrologers with the um with that confidence that they are in touch with the divine will as it were revealed to them through their special knowledge of the planetary movements and the meanings of uh, of the heavens and then people listen to that uh, the the person who's come in for the reading they they easily can you know there's there's a kind of respect that automatically can come in to uh many people who the, they don't know how to read their chart and this person is, does seem to have that ability and so they they seem to be kind of in touch with something that i need to listen to but if that person is telling them all these things about well you better watch out next year is not going to you know n next year uh this and this and this is going to happen or or don't you know don't pursue this relationship it, it doesn't have a, a chance that that type of um concrete overconfident directiveness uh, based on like because you have this particular midpoint in the fifth house um, it, it's just not uh, it's not ethical as well as I think not um, not a it's not true to uh, and faithful to the mystery of astrology it's great it's great uh, depths and uh, iridescent uh, multivalence of meaning. You know, it's every, every single um, part of our chart has such depth and richness of potential ways in which a particular aspect, a particular planetary position, uh, a particular transit, there's so many ways in which that can express itself, unfold in one's life, depending on what we bring to it, what, what our the level of our our consciousness or what courage we we um uh enter into the equation with and and also what our context is and all those things play such a big role and so we really need to have um when we do astrological counseling we need to uh in a sense bring our our full uh rigor and our full depth of humanity and c capacity for relationship uh, into uh, and care for the person, care, care for their future, uh, rather than imposing our particular um, diluted conviction that we, we've, we've got a kind of direct access to the uh, divine will. So Rick, based on your worldview of how astrology can function, what is your specific definition as to what the astrology of the future looks like? Well, that's an easy question. Um, I mean, the future of astrology is being, you know, shaped uh, by all the all the people right now who are exploring it. And, and of course, there's been a real renaissance in in your generation of uh, uh, of interest in astrology, I think I think the whole generation that was born with the Uranus Neptune conjunction um, 
you know, really starting in the later 80s, going right through the 90s, uh, that generation, the Uranus-Neptune conjunction can bring about much more, uh, um, much more openness, uh, technically I'd call it like epistemological fluidity and openness, less armoring, less boundary, uh, more capacity to, uh, you know, be open to the spiritual dimension of life, for example, or, uh, and it, it often can indicate a greater um, interest in and access to esoteric knowledge. So uh, a lot of the, what's going to happen in the future of astrology is being shaped at this moment by um, a generation younger than me, uh, th that is, uh, I, I think m my generation particularly brought in a focus on uh, bringing in the psychological um, depth psychology, integrating Jung, uh, transpersonal psychology, archetypal psychology, uh, rep uh, bringing in more of a, f a focus on the use of astrology to help us um, become more conscious of our unconscious and be more skillful participants in, in the complexities of life. Um, a, a, maybe a, a, a great focus on astrology being an emancipatory discipline rather than a predictive one that is can can be confining of a person's life depending on how it's used, but instead uh, that it can serve our, our, our further uh, flowering. Um, and I, th and also I think there, there was a, a lot of integration of a lot uh, and, and scholarly work in integrating um, traditional astro uh, astrological, various astrological traditions, whether coming from India or coming from uh, the Hellenistic era, um, et cetera. I think the generation that is emerging right now has assimilated um, all that. And I think it's premature to say exactly what's going to come out of um, what's, what's being formed right now. But I believe because of the greater mm, kind of openness to the, the idea that the cosmos is intrinsically meaningful, uh, that has become more, more widespread. Uh, the fact that there are people who are doing you know, spiritual practices that put them in touch with other, uh, with non-ordinary realities, uh, extraordinary states of consciousness, shamanic practices, sacred medicine journeys, um, ayahuasca ritual, uh, uh, psychedelic therapy, and so forth. Um, uh, vision, wilderness quests, various initiatory practices, all these help open us up to um, a a relationship to the ensouled cosmos that astrology can help us um, articulate the the specific dynamics of that of the of the anima mundi, the soul of the world, and our embeddedness in it, and also it can articulate the dynamics of how we as individuals are embedded in a collective psyche, so that. You know, there are things happening that we participate in that the whole world is participating in right now. Uh, so clear, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction we're, we're going through right now with a triple conjunction with Jupiter um, uh, or whole, during the whole last uh, decade or more, the, the Uranus square Pluto that was, has, was going on. These are times when we all participate in a larger collective field that is um, unmistakably distinctive. We, we, we have the sense that we're all breathing the same 
air, so to speak. Uh, and it, it's a zeitgeist that we participate in. And astrology can illuminate that larger zeitgeist at the same time as it can illuminate our individual um, participation in it by looking at our birth chart and how the planets in the sky now, like where that triple conjunction of Saturn, Jupiter, and Pluto uh, are falling right in our chart um, and uh, what it's transiting right now in our personal lives and chart. And that, uh, in, in all those ways, I think astrology could, in the future, help more and more people live um, more conscious lives, more skillful lives, more loving lives, uh, to the extent that they use astrology to better empathically understand where the other person is coming from. Like, once you see the chart of somebody that you've been having trouble with, uh, you can suddenly see, oh, that's where they're coming from, or this is, this is what they're dealing with. I mean, this is the lens through which they're seeing the world and look and see how it matches up with mine and how I might be also projecting some of my stuff into the, into the um, relationship and so forth. Or you, st I recommend very much people study any person that's in the current news, for example, that, or, or a cultural figure, a, a singer, a, 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 a you know, a, a filmmaker, um, a poet, whatever is the, a, a person that you, a musician that you're really compelled by, look at their charts. I mean, we live in a time where you can just, you know, put in their name into the computer, um, look up, you know, when they were born, uh, where they were born. It's typically there for most people now that are, that are, are public figures. Astro Data Bank has additional information about even the birth time for, for a very large number of, of those public figures. If, we, if you do that consistently, you learn so much and about how astrology works. You, you get insight into how, what's informing those people's lives, their genius, their, their, their crises, whatever it is that you're looking at. And um, in, in all those ways, I think it can help us um, not only live day to day in a more illuminated, uh, skillful way, uh, compassionate, and, and uh, so forth, but it also can give us a sense of being centered or grounded in a meaningful and purposeful cosmos in which my sense of individual purpose and meaning is not seen as being this kind of isolated bubble in a vast meaningless cosmos, which is what the mainstream world view that we've kind of inherited uh, coming out of the um, later stages of the scientific revolution and the, and the disenchantment of the universe is, is that there's no meaning and purpose out there. Any meaning and purpose is only human, a human construct, something that we subjectively bring into, into life. But it's, the cosmos itself is blind, randomly uh, uh, evolving, um, has no particular care for a given uh, individual person or, or uh, a, let alone or species or the, the earth is just another speck of dust going around one amongst billions and billions of stars in the vast cosmos. Astrology can give a, a kind of revelation of the fact that we are living on a planet the earth, Gaia, that is in some sense a kind of meaning, a focus of cosmic meaning and purpose. And the movements of the planets uh, 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 and uh, around the sun and, and in relationship to the earth and the movement and the, the earth's uh, shifting um, angular relationships to sun and moon um, and its cycles, their cycles, and then uh, all the planets as they form their aspects in relationship to the earth, 
those con constantly are coinciding with this um, vast symphony of meaning that is m focused on this planet, on this earth. It's a kind of care that the cosmos is showing to our planet. It's a kind of, it's an act of love in a way that's, it's, that it, it's constantly kind of bathing us in this orchestration of, of meaning. And when you awaken to that, it, uh, it can, there's, there's a healing effect that comes from having that awakening. You suddenly break out of the secluded bubble of alienated consciousness of, you know, like man in the blind cosmos, man and nature. I'm, I'm using the, the uh, masculine um, rendering of the human being purposefully because it is in some sense a kind of patriarchal uh, construct that uh, of the human relationship, the human being and the human relationship to the, to nature, uh, the, which we are nature, we are the cosmos in human form, but that tendency to be um, seeing ourselves as this kind of, you know, man isolated, but brilliant and heroically taking on the uh, hostile uh, world and cosmos is uh, it's there's something that is very alienating and ultimately disorienting about it because it, it means that everything that is most precious to us has no relationship to the big picture to the to the cosmos itself and astrology kind of heals that it opens up like oh my god I'm I'm embedded in something that's much that's that's much bigger uh, and deeper than I thought, uh, and it's informing me. I, it lives in me, and it, in some sense, kind of cares about me, and it cares about this earth, and about every individual and every moment. So that's a uh, that's the kind of future of astrology that I would ideally like to see unfold. That was a long answer, I, uh, Michael. I hope you don't mind, but anyway. It, you asked a big question. It was a great answer. It was exactly the right size <laughs> based on the question. Thank you. Rick, as you spoke about the various ways in which we can interact with healing today, and as you brought up this concept of the shamanic expression of the healing process, whether that be through plant medicine or through journeying, I'm reminded of something that Terence McKenna said within his writings, which was that the redemption of the world, if it is to happen at all, must be done through magic. And by magic, he was referring to these various ways of interacting with the cosmos around us with a sense of depth and awe and wonder, essentially. So do you feel as if our astrology is a part of this magical reclamation of the world? Or where do you feel astrology fits within this greater context of reclaiming an aspect of ourselves that has been lost through our modernity? I think astrology can be and is for many exactly what you're describing and what Terence was um, uh, who uh I, I I knew him quite well and actually he he when he passed away he was just a, a, within a mile of where I, I am right now um yes the uh what Terence is is referring to there I think is is his recognition that, the, hu the future of the human being, he talks about redemption, and uh, which is a, is a very spiritual term. Um, in some sense, even survival of the human being is at stake uh, at this point as well, certainly of, of, of a kind of, of human beings as we know them. And uh, that it would be that this, either one of those, 
would be dependent upon basically coming into a different relationship to the whole. And magic is a good uh, handy term for describing overcoming that, that bubble, that uh, armored um, boundary, that uh, the wall that keeps the, the modern mind and modern psyche from uh, realizing its, its kinship with the whole and its, its uh, relationship to the whole and different forms of magic can serve that opening. Now, the problem is even astrology can be, mm, every, it can be uh, exploited uh, and used for other purposes. Yeah, it forms of magic can too. Um, uh, there's, that, that's why there's um, the great spiritual teachers always emphasize that uh, for any, far more important is a, a moral evolution than a kind of technical empowerment of your magical skills. Uh, and, uh, but if you bring those two together, that's where the, the beauty can, can unfold. And, um, and I, and you mentioned like, you know, like plant medicine and, you know, shamanic, uh, journeying of, of, of various kinds. And I, our society by our society, I'm particularly thinking of, you know, the one, I mean, you're in, you're in the Caribbean has very rich, uh, ritual traditions, um, that you're, uh, no doubt conversant with and, and, um, can speak to the the society that is kind of like the the mainstream society that has dominated uh, the Europe and the, and and much of North America, the United States, is one in which um, like modern Western civilization, as we've known it up until the last few years. Uh, that has excluded the existence of um, initiatory rites of passage that could allow for the healing of the rupture between human self and world. Every other society has had those rituals, has, have, has had those um, rites of passage those initiatory practices that basically allow a person as they're going through a certain threshold of, of life maturation or a, a crisis of some kind or uh, 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 births and deaths uh, uh, that uh, marriage, um, all those huge um, thresholds in life Societies had pra had ritual practices established that could um, that helped constellate a kind of dying of the old identity, the narrow identity, and a rebirth into a deeper identity that is, for example, conscious of what is going to be important for seven generations from now and not just for the next uh, uh, corporate uh, quarterly profit report or not just for my own personal uh, uh, satisfaction over the, it, it, but rather you're thinking of the larger community, the larger whole, uh, you're thinking of the future of, of, I mean, our civilization right now is, has been so dismissive of what future generations are going to experience by how it's been treating the environment. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an overwhelming reality. And all of us, you know, I'm, I'm now 70. Um, and uh, the, you know, my children, my grandchildren, I have got one granddaughter at this point, and all those of their, their ages. I mean, um, we have such work carried uh, to carry out to um, kind of overcome this 
disregard for the whole, disregard for the future, disregard for the, the other um, sentient beings on our planet, on our Earth, in, uh, of our Earth community. And the beauty of and importance of initiatory practices of which magic can be considered, you know, the, one of them or, or a, 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 a feature of, uh, of, of, a, uh, of an initiatory practice. Um, those can, can help us break out of the constraints of the narrow vision that has gotten us to this global crisis. And so, uh, again, I think astrology can be boxed in to a particular to serve very narrow ne egoistic purposes. Like, how am, how am I going to, you know, uh, manipulate the stock market so that I, uh, uh, you know, make a lot of personal profit and uh and then can withdraw to my own island of of safety uh i'm exaggerating but <laughs> you know astrology can be used uh i think not for very long in a deeply successful way but it, it can be attempted to be used to serve very narrow egoistic purposes and um uh i think uh if we, that's that's one reason why the practice of astrology is, I think, best conjoined with deep inner work, journeying, um, psychotherapy, breath work, um, you know, shamanic journeys, wilderness, uh, spiritual uh, uh, vision quests, and so forth. Um, work on behalf of the community. Uh, uh, in a uh, hospice work and so forth. In a sense, we each have to kind of pay close attention to what, what opportunities are being shown to us, what doors are being offered to us as ways to um, pursue our, our, uh, our journey. And, um, and also what inside me, we have to, we, we have to gain a kind of, um, sensitive alertness to what voice inside me is kind of directing me in, in certain directions that will uh, be most authentic to who, what my journey is, because yours, Michael, is going to be different than mine. It's going to overlap in, in certain ways, which this uh, conversation is all about. In certain, uh, but you also have such a... Um, you know, a, a rich individuality of your own uh, that is discovered by uh, your, you know, that Grateful Dead song. This 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 path is for your your for you alone, um, your steps alone, and uh, there takes a kind of um, sensitive alertness to what that voice is inside of us or where, what our our inner daimon is you know that kind of divine let's call it like a seed that that uh seeks to to flower in a particular way that is unique to you um you the listener uh of our of our dialogue and and um that's one of the beauties of, of this earth and of the cosmos is that it is fulfilled in itself through expressing itself in a highly individuated way through each of us. Uh, there isn't like a, a cookie cutter um, right way and then a wrong way. In fact, the the deep way of unfolding for all of us will definitely in, involve some wrong turns. <laughs> That's uh, and and then awakening to that and going through the transformation, which could involve remorse. It could be in, involve uh, facing um, the shadow uh, that we didn't want to see in ourselves or uh, see in our actions. Um, 
but that, uh, in a sense, that's what our whole civilization is having to do right now is to really take account of its um, shadow, how it's treated the rest of the earth, how, how, um, how whites have treated people of color, how men have treated women in patriarchal societies for, uh, for, for millennia. Uh, and, um, and how human beings treat animals, uh, uh, that are non-human. Um, all these are first, there has to be a, a deep recognition of what, uh, of that shadow an acknowledgement of it. Um, and then, a kind of transformation that can take place that in which the very, you know, that, that beautiful song, Amazing Grace, as, as you no doubt know, that was written by a, a slave ship captain. Um, and he meant it when he said um, that this amazing grace, that it could save a wretch like me. He wasn't just coming, he, wretch wasn't like, oh, I'm going to just, prostrate myself as being, you know, this humble uh, sinner in a kind of ritualistic way uh, that is in a uh, pro forma way. He was saying that because he really knew that he was a moral wretch to have been doing what he was doing. And he awakened to it and transformed his life. Uh, and in some sense, that that is a crucial part of um, the, that's a threshold, that facing of the shadow, that then opens us up to uh, the, the, the much bigger opportunities uh, that can only open up once we've gone through that kind of eye of the needle of the, um, the painful, um, the agony in the garden as, as uh, we have in the biblical tradition in the New Testament. You know, Rick, in you mentioning the Grateful Dead, I am remembering that there's a line in, in one of their songs that says that we need a miracle every day. And when I hear you speak about astrology as not just this standalone thing that we do in our ziggurats and our ivory towers as we look out into the cosmos in a form of seeking for ourselves outside of ourselves, what I hear you saying is that the miracle is really within and that we are all partakers of this thing that Julius Evola in his book, The Hermetic Tradition, calls subspecie interioritatis, which means that which dwells within the heart of interiority. So we all take part in a cosmos that isn't out there, but it is deeply within each and every one of us. And when we come to that realization of this interiority of our own cosmic life, then it allows us to interact with the world in which we find ourselves in with greater integrity and greater humility and greater reverence all around. And I do think that that is essentially the miracle that we're in need of every day, this miracle of being constantly and continuously and in an eternally renewing way in awe of this life that we all share. That's, that's, that's beautiful, Michael. And I think you've, um, see, that's the thing is that astrologers themselves can get um, so accustomed to their, uh, their ephemeris and their uh, computer programs and seeing the, you know, and, and kind of clicking through the, the uh, correlations and so forth. And they can lose the sense of awe. They can lose the recognition that what they're looking at is a miracle. Um, this shouldn't be happening in a random meaningless cosmos. So uh, recognizing that is like a kind each of these are like little, every correlation that, that we see, we recognize in um, our life experience being meaningfully connected to where the planets are and what our birth chart is about. Uh, um, every time we discern that, that is a, there's a, at that moment is a, uh, 
it's an opportunity to uh, for awe. It's like um, this is a this is a communication from the interior of the larger cosmos to the interior of our inner cosmos, and uh, because those planets really are both out there and in here, and um, recognizing this as above, so below, as um, uh, without, so within, recognizing this um, holistic integrity of the flow of life is a uh, provides that that uh, that opportunity for a deep awe. Uh, you, you, it's a very good word that you used. Aristotle, actually, even Socrates seems to have said that we, you know, that philosophy begins in wonder. Um, and you could say wonder, it's got a couple of meanings. Uh, one, one meaning of wonder would be, uh, hmm, I wonder how that works. Um, like the, 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 the curiosity of that it makes us explore uh, and un to understand better. And that's an important part of wonder, an impart important part of philosophy, science, astrology, uh, etc. But then there's the wonder of, wow, awe, a sense of the numinous, of, of, of the sacred, of, of, something that, of something more than the reductionist assumptions about how life uh, is, might be understood in the uh, light of common day, as Wordsworth put it. Um, it we, we, we say light of common day. Uh, that's like when the, it's, you, you need to have the, the, the mystery of the night and the clarity of the day constantly in a kind of interplay. Uh, it's, a, it's like a, the solar and the lunar need to be both, uh, both present and in the, in the interplay of the sacred marriage for, for us to get a, a, a fuller sense of, of the nature of things. I love it, Rick. And I really love that you're standing in a space that allows you to inform the thinkers of tomorrow through the work that you're doing, through CIIS, but also through the books that you've written and the way in which those books really serve this timeless purpose of taking us back into the heart of our humanity, but also fundamentally taking us back into the heart of the cosmos and realizing that it's the same heart that we're referring to. And through an awareness of that heart, we can all realize our place within the cosmic scheme of things. So I think the world essentially is needing more people like you to do the work that you're doing and to do the work that you've done in order for the thinkers of tomorrow to be informed by this sense of awe, to be informed by this sense of the numinous, so that after their four years, five years, however long, pursuing higher education, they come out with this fundamental platform of wonder within them that doesn't make them feel as if they've locked into a very specific sort of relationship to reality, but that fundamentally allows them to take part in the continuous unfolding and the continuous exploration of life that's that's beautifully put michael and uh um yes perhaps i'm 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 playing a small role in that and uh perhaps you are playing uh, a, a very significant role too as you um you with your own um unique both uh journey and range of uh, interests and knowledge that has come into you over your life and and now your own and your your powers of articulation and your capacity to and and impulse to to share with others um, through the uh, forms that you that you're doing um, it's very it's it's uh, really admirable and uh, and inspiring Michael thank you so much Rick now Rick, tell our listeners and viewers 
what is next for you within your own personal universe? Are you working on anything now? Can we expect another book from you? What is next in terms of your contribution, not just academically, but to the greater collective? Um, well, um, now that I'm getting to that age where I'm needing to be very conscious of the fact that I don't, um, it's funny when you're, when once younger, you, I mean, you know, you're going to die at some point, but it's so often the future barring any, uh, you know, sudden um, mishaps uh, that it kind of gives a, a less of a sense of urgency to get every, you know, to get done what needs to be done. But now that uh, I know that I can't rely on uh, an indefinite number of years in front of me where I'm going to have the intellectual lucidity and, you know, kind of creative stamina that's necessary to to uh, bring forth my remaining books, it's it's uh, it's kind of concentrated my mind on like using these next few years to get to get those books out, which I they're pretty much you know mostly written in in notebook form. See, I'm you, I've only got two books out there, each of which took over ten years to write. So um, I seem to be one of those people who have a long gestation and I, the, the books that are remaining in me, I've been gestating for decades and I've been, you know, writing in notebook form uh, uh, and they're in my file folders or here on this computer and so forth. And um, what I, so I'm starting to uh, teach I, uh, less frequently, you know, I still play an active role uh, in my philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program, um, and and teach each year, but not with the um, as as many courses per year as I used to, which so that it can allow me to um, spend a certain amount of time each day to get these books done, and uh, some of the. Uh, well, the first book I'm going to uh, complete is to finish editing a fest drift, a, uh, a book of honor of essays honoring um, Stanislav Grof, who is a, a dear teacher and friend of mine, and uh, who's now who will be turning 90 next year. And I want to get this book of uh, I've got great uh, essays by uh, many scholars um, all ready to go in that scholars like Joseph Campbell by uh, and. Uh, Fritjof Capra and uh, Houston Smith and so forth, but uh, others more contemporary that are with us right now. So I, that's the first book. But then once that's done, I have a number of I have, uh, books, um, astrological books that I want to bring out, uh, as well as books that uh, or a book that looks at the um, at our moment in history and uh, what how to understand this dramatic, paradoxical, pivotal period uh, uh, of, of Earth evolution as well as human history. So that one's a, a major importance for me, uh, including addressing the whole idea of, is there an arc of the moral universe? Uh, uh, and if so, what, what can we say about it? What form has it taken and might it take? So that's one book that's very dear to me. But others are be, will be on. Uh, I uh, be like a handbook on the planetary archetypes. Um, another one on uh, you know going into many many detailed um, uh, analysis of every planetary combination as it's expressed itself in major cultural uh, f uh, figures and. Um, I did it in a way, the big overview of, of cultural history in Cosmos and Psyche, but this will be more um, individually oriented, like, you know, lo looking at the, um, at, the, at, the, at the birth charts and transits of, you know, everybody from, uh, you know, Martin Luther King to Jane Austen, you know, um, and uh, there's just, it's, I've got, 
pr probably more than one book that I that's ready to. I just have to. Takes me a while to put it into polished, publishable form to my satisfaction. So I've got a little bit of time that it's going to take for each of these to be done right. Um, another one on the art of writing that uh, I've given many um, classes over the years and lectures on the art and discipline of writing. And I'd like to put that into a, because uh, that writing is a kind of spiritual path too, as well as a, um, a very uh, important practice for certain kinds of people, because we really need the, the valuable ideas, new ideas that people are getting, we need those to be communicated in an effective way to bridge, bridge those gaps, you know, that we were talking about earlier. So I have a book on that, that I'll have. So you can see, I've got a few in the pipeline that are in, in the oven, uh, as, as we say. Well, I'm really excited for all of them. And starting from the last one, as a young journalist still in university, I got exposed to the book On Writing Well by William Zinser. Yeah, very good book, yeah. It's an amazing book. And so the thought that you, someone who's writing I love and I admire so dearly, would come up with a book on the art of writing is definitely something that I'm going to look forward to. Because Thank you. definitely, definitely, Rick, because I have struggled myself to complete my own books that, <laughs> that are within me because I think we get so caught up in the actual day-to-day -day minutia, and then we get caught up in all of the things that we have to do. We have to teach, we have to show up for others, we have to give consultations, and that tangible expression of our craft, it oftentimes seems more overwhelming or more pertinent than this deep inner yearning that we have to share the knowledge that is within us. So I'm definitely going to hold a space of accountability within me for you to continue to take that time each and every day to dedicate to your writing because i even remember in reading cosmos and psyche and this is the book here for those of our listeners and viewers well viewers really who want to to dive into this work i remember how beautiful your writing on Saturn was and Pluto was specifically in the portion in which you were speaking about 9-11 and how you really brought it in in a way where I was yearning to hear you write an entire chapter on Saturn or to hear you write an entire chapter on Neptune or to just hear what your other thoughts were in terms of the planets as their own individual archetypes within themselves so that too is another book that i'm really interested in you finishing so <laughs> so so here here's the list i mean from from one of your biggest fans the art of writing is definitely one that i'll be looking out for as well as the book on the planetary archetypes because i i think you have so much to share and i can't wait to celebrate that through purchasing those books well th thank you and i and i and um do set aside a certain amount of time each day yourself you have to create that 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 ritual space uh, uh, both in time and in your your home or wherever that's a kind of uh, sacred circle within which you can you can do your creative work and it's very important to to find ways of holding that that sacred and it might be just an hour a day it might be three hours a day but it's uh, you, you, you need to keep close contact with the source spring of your, of your creativity by having a daily relationship to, to it. Uh, and so that means kind of thinking through in advance, like how am I going to schedule my, my days and weeks in advance so that this one, at least, you know, several times per week, you, you really can give a, a particular sustained amount of time to this practice because otherwise it's not going to happen um you, you just you that's the the muses need to feel that you're going to be there uh uh and um maybe i'll just i'll, I'll just 
mention one other helpful piece of advice that a, a great uh, she's she, a, a novelist actually from from the Bay Area named Annie Lamott. She said, um, "Always carry a pencil and pa and paper or pen and paper and uh, with you um, when you're on your walk or whatever, because um, if you don't." then God will give the ideas to somebody who does. <laughs> um, and there's something about being able to write it down when the, when the thought comes, clothed in the words that come right at that moment. There's often a certain um, creative vitality that is there at that moment that you may not be able to access um, you know, a few days later when you're thinking, what was that really good idea I had back then? Um, you know, so you, 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 you want to be it's a kind of uh, fidelity to, to your gift that you have to um, practice. Well, that last piece that you said from Annie Lamont about God giving that thought to somebody else who does carry their pen and paper is similar to dream work, where as soon as you wake up in the morning, you have to write that dream down because if you give yourself the time for your day to create a momentum around you even if you just get out of bed and go to the restroom and think that you're going to do it when you come back the dream disappears so i i love this thought that you brought up about tapping in to the potency of that creative wellspring in that moment because that moment we as astrologers know is irreplaceable and it will never happen again so i will take that advice and coming out of this interview with you, I am going to take another look at my piles and piles and piles of rough draft. And I'm going to, to definitely dive into creating some sacred space around hewing something truly golden out of that raw material you have a voice that no, that uh, that no one no one else has in in your particular way you know and you have a a, a certain um fund of experience that's yours alone and um yeah it writing's not for everybody uh and it's not an easy path but it's um it is for certain people it's the it, it's the way uh that they um and we're going to need uh you know really skillful writers who can can help the the unfolding of 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 our our age in a in a life enhancing fruitful way so good i'm it's already been a worthwhile interview if you're going to take that little thing from it and uh and we, we'll look forward to what comes forth Thank you so much, Rick, for coming and sharing in this space with me. I have truly learned a lot just being in this virtual astrological space with you. And I thank you and I honor your work. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you for having me, Michael. And uh, uh, good luck with your, your very uh, important work as well. And um, you're a great interviewer. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad you're out there doing uh, what you're doing and may you flourish and also may your may your uh, listeners um, co continue to to uh, be enriched by by what you're bringing them thank you so much rick and to those same listeners to those of you who if this was your hundredth time joining us here on the oraculous true divination podcast or if this was time number one i just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for continuing to come here and share in this virtual astrological space with us i receive your comments i receive your feedback i receive your encouragement but most importantly i receive your love so if you want to continue to be a part of this magical community that we're building over here on the oraculos true divination podcast give yourself a moment yes go down below and like this video but also subscribe to the oraculos true divination podcast and share this video with your other astrologically and mystically minded friends because more and more people need to know about these amazing conversations that we're having right here on the oraculos true divination podcast so until next time I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, wishing you peace, leaving you in hope. Until we meet again, bye-bye. 
Rick Tarnas. Thank you. Uh, you're, you're really good at what you do. 